Three, two, one, here we go. Rain Man's Take podcast. Observations on the world we live in. My take on current events and other topics of interest. Also, interviews with some really cool people. So let's get the conversation going. Hey everybody, it's the Rain Man. Just want to give a quick shout out to everybody watching. Thank you very much. I know you're going to find this next raindrop thought provoking. I feel very strongly about these subjects and I know you do too. So go ahead and hit the like button and subscribe. That way we can continue bringing you great content in the future. So thanks again for being a part of Rain Man's Take and enjoy this raindrop. Hey everybody, it's the Rain Man coming at you with another raindrop today. The topic of this episode is my take on the comparisons between current climate events and similar climactic events in the past. This is what I think every time I hear or read in the media, a comparison of a current event to the same event happening many years in the past. This is how I look at it. If a weather event as a function of changing climate occurs in the present time, and it is said that it is the worst of its kind in XYZ years. And if XYZ years ago was before the modern industrial age, when supposedly man started to really pollute the environment, or before the population began to increase around the world, then wasn't the climate producing just as bad event outcomes in the past without human influence. How do you reconcile that? So before I get into my take on that, this is something that I've always found thought provoking. And I don't know if my thinking is correct. And I would really love to have your feedback on it. I honestly don't know if I'm right or wrong in thinking this way. It's just how my mind processes this information especially in light of the major push by the climate change and global warming movement, and I'll go ahead and call them the global elite or the Davos crowd, to curb our freedoms and lifestyles with outlandish and dangerous policy recommendations, all in the name of saving the planet. So please send me your comments if you disagree or agree with what what I'm about to say. So what is my take? The climate is and has been constantly changing and has been producing these events without human inputs in the past. Yes, these events are bad, but it's just in the modern world where there are more humans around to experience these events. So they seem worse to us now, but the fact is that there's just more people, but that doesn't necessarily impact the cycle of climate changing. And I believe that debate has yet to be settled. So the fact that it's happening again now, doesn't that just mean that we're in a climate cycle where the weather, climate, and environment is just repeating itself? And if the outcomes are the same with or without the industrialized world, then is that industrialized world the reason for the current event happening? Is man responsible for these current events, or are we just here to witness the current cycle of change in the climate? Take, for example, this article from NBC News Online by by Denise Chow from February 15, 2022, titled U.S. Mega Drought Worst in at least 1,200 Years, Researchers Say. The article reads, the mega drought that has gripped the southwestern United States for the past 22 years is the worst since at least 800 AD, according to a new study that examined shifts in water availability and soil moisture over the past 12 centuries. The research, which suggests that the past two decades in American Southwest has been the driest period in 1,200 years, pointed to human-caused climate change as a major reason for this current drought's severity. The research that they're referring to was published in the journal Nature Climate Change. Here is the abstract from that study. A previous reconstruction back to 800 CE, common era, 
indicated that the 2000 through 2018 soil moisture deficit in southwestern North America was exceeded during one mega drought in the late 1500s. Here, we show that after exceptional drought severity in 2021, 19% of which is attributed to anthropogenic climate trends, 2000 to 2021 was the driest 22-year period since at least 800 AD. This drought will very likely persist through 2022, matching the duration of the late 1500s mega drought. So let me ask you this, what happened uh, to cause the mega drought 1200 years ago, or in the late 1500s, if man was not the main cause of it. What caused these events to be that bad 1200 years ago, clearly well before human activity could have had an impact. What caused that? Bottom line is the climate always changes and goes in cycles, regardless if humans have been around in abundance or not. Okay, the article continues. Jason Smurden, one of the study's authors and a climate scientist at Columbia University's Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory said, global warming has made the mega drought more extreme because it creates a thirstier atmosphere that is better able to pull moisture out of the forests, vegetation, and soil. It is a slow motion train wreck, he said. What we showed in the paper is that increasing temperatures in the Southwest contributed about 42% to the severity of the drought. So let me ask you, what caused the atmosphere to be as thirsty or thirstier 1,200 years ago? The region over the past 12 centuries, some even, la even lasting up to 30 years. Before the current mega drought, the region had not experienced such dry conditions since medieval times in the late 1500s. But while droughts occur naturally throughout history, climate change is making them both more frequent and more intense, the scientist said. That's actually not how I read that last paragraph. The article continues, and compared to other mega droughts in historical record, what's surprising is this current drought shows no signs of letting up, said A. Park Williams, a client scientist at the University of California, Los Angeles, and the study's lead author. 22 years in, some of these big mega droughts in the past were starting to peter out, he said. This drought is not petering out. Instead, it's in full swing and is as strong now as it was before. But what they just said was the worst drought in the last 1,200 years lasted 30 years, which is eight years longer than the current drought is right now. Humans have been dealing with the effects of climate change for millennia. According to the Encyclopedia Britannica's description of the Great Drought of North America from 1276 to 1299, the Great Drought affected much of what is now the Western United States and has had a profound influence upon the plants, animals, and prehistoric Native American cultures in the region. Ancestral Pueblo, or Anastasi, and the Hohokam peoples were particularly affected by the Great Drought. After repeated years of crop failure, they were compelled to abandon their towns and disperse across the land. Parallel reductions in wild food sources affected nomadic peoples, and social disruptions are thought to have occurred as nomads and former farmers were, paced, were placed in competition for the few resources that survived under the very dry conditions. And finally, I want to touch on another article from the University of Texas News dated November 11, 2010 by Corey Leahy titled Medieval Warm Period, Not So Random. People who dispute evidence of recent global warming sometimes point to episodes in the past a thousand years called the Little Ice Age and the Medieval Warm Period, times when the Northern Hemisphere temperatures were higher or lower than average for decades or even centuries. As examples of internal variability, a kind of natural randomness in the climate system that can't be explained by any specific forcing. He continues, if true, perhaps internal variability could explain the current rapid global warming, skeptics argue. In other words, maybe our current warming is just an unlucky roll of the dice, a blip rather than a long-term trend. I'm not sure what he's saying there because he just said that those natural variabilities sometimes lasted decades or even centuries. So they were not just blips on the screen. Climate scientists now understand that the medieval warm period was caused by an increase in solar radiation and a decrease in volcanic activity, which both promoted warming. Other evidence suggests ocean circulation patterns shifted to bring warmer seawater into the North Atlantic. And as we'll see in the next section, those kinds of natural changes have not been detected in the past few years. 
except according to uh, Down to Earth Online Science and Technology article from September 2022 by Akshit Sangamala titled Cold Comfort. The sun is cooling, but it doesn't mean there'll be no global warming. Interesting, art, uh, interesting headline there. In that article, it states, um, a new 11-year cycle of the sun has begun. Scientists believe that the sun was at its weakest in 2019 in the last 100 years or so, known as the solar minimum. The 2020 marks the beginning of the 25th cycle. But the odd thing is that solar activity measured by the number of sunspots at any given time is pretty low even in 2020. Scientists say the sun may be going through a long period of decreased activity known as, known as the modern grand solar minimum from 2020 to 2053. The last time such an event occurred was during the Maunder minimum from 1645 AD to 1710 AD, which was part of what was known as the Little Ice Age, which they were just describing above. When the earth went through a series of elongated cold spirit cold periods during the medieval centuries and I just want to touch on one more article to continue on my point of comparing current events with past events. According to Kelly Taylor Hayes from Fox 13 Tampa Bay weather site from August 29 2019 in an article titled. These are the five worst hurricanes that have made landfall in the U.S. The article reads when combining the worst of the worst, there are a handful of storms that change history of the country. Here are the five of the most significant hurricanes to have made landfall in the United States. And just notice that three out of the five of these hurricanes all occurred before 1928. First, Galveston Hurricane of 1990 in Galveston, Texas, is by far the deadliest natural disaster to impact the United States. It made landfall on September 8, 1900, and was a Category 4 hurricane with winds of 145 miles per hour. Galveston hit Galveston was hit with catastrophic damage, but the destruction wasn't confined just to the Gulf area. Even though there have been more intense hurricanes over the years, the Galveston hurricane caused massive destruction and a record death toll. It is easily considered to be the worst storm to hit the United States. Again, that was in 1900. Galveston sits at nine feet above sea level, and the storm surge rose, rose to 15 feet. 3,600 homes were destroyed, 8,000 people died, which was about 20% of Galveston's population at the time, and 30,000 were injured. $21 million in damage, which is equivalent of about $641 million in today's dollars. Number two is the Miami hurricane of 1926. Max winds recorded were 150 miles per hour, $105 million of damage back then, which is the equivalent of 90 billion had occurred uh, had this hurricane occurred in recent times, and 372 people died and 6,000 were injured. Number three was the Okeechobee hurricane of 1928. The hurricane's 145 mile per hour winds and high storm surge destroyed 1,700 homes along the Florida coast. 4,079 deaths, second deadliest hurricane on record. 1,200 died in Guadalupe, 312 in Puerto Rico, and 2,500 in the U.S. $100 million in damage, which is the equivalent of about $1.4 billion in today's dollars. Devastation in Puerto Rico uh, alone, 24,000 homes were destroyed, 192,000 damaged, and 500,000 people were left homeless. The storm surge caused flooding hundreds of square miles with as much as 20 feet of water. And again, that was in 1928. Number four is Hurricane Andrew from 1992. It made landfall with a central pressure of 922 MB, making it the fourth most intense hurricane to strike the US. 175 mile winds, $26.5 billion in damage, uh, 63,000 homes destroyed and 124,000 homes damaged. 65 deaths and 1.4 million people lost power at the height of the storm. 70,000 trees down in the Everglades and 80% of the trees were lost in the Atchafalaya River Basin. Not that this matters to the climate change or global warming crowd, but $500 million in losses for the oil companies during uh, Hurricane Andrew. And then number five of the top five hurricanes that hit the U.S. is Hurricane Katrina in 2005. And as everybody knows, um, it tops the list as the costliest natural disaster and the third deadliest storm to hit the United States. Katrina's most 
catastrophic impacts were from the storm surge rather than, rather than the wind because of its sheer size. The surge penetrated six miles inland across most of southern Mississippi and up to 12 miles inland along the bays and the rivers. Breaching of levees and flood walls in 80% of New Orleans was actually underwater. $108 billion in damage, the costliest on record. 1,500 people died with 200 of these were, uh, and 200 of these were killed from flooding in, the Missis in Mississippi and over 6,000 people were injured. So uh, you have people today saying this is the worst it's ever been. It's going to get worse and it's going to be worse in the future because of global warming, because of man-made global warming and our influence on the environment. The doomsayers haven't been right for decades with the vast majority of apocalyptic predictions not coming to fruition. I believe the elites, the Davos crowd, are using these scare tactics to assert as much control over the citizens of the world as possible. I've said this before in other episodes, two things that really frustrate me about the climate change argument. First one is the hypocritical elites in the media, in Hollywood, and in politics and business, the Davos crowd, like I call them telling us how we need to live our lives while doing almost the exact opposite. And two, the media trying to convince us that the science is settled and there's a unanimous consensus that man is responsible for a lot of the damage being done to the climate. The reality is that debate is far from settled. Case in point is a recent declaration signed by almost 1,200 scientists and professionals stating that there is no climate emergency. This is from an article by Chris Morrison from August 18th, 2022. He is the Daily Skeptics environmental editor. The article reads, the political fiction that humans cause most or all climate change and the claim that the science behind this notion is settled has been dealt a savage blow by the publication of the World Climate Declaration or the WCD signed by over 1100 scientists and professionals. Further quoting the article. The scale of the opposition to modern day settled science is remarkable, given how difficult it is in academia to raise grants for any climate research that departs from the political orthodoxy. Professor Richard Lind Zen has called the current climate narrative absurd, but acknowledged that trillions of dollars and the relentless propaganda from grant dependent academics and agenda driven journalists currently says it is not absurd. The gap between the real world and the modeled world tells us that we are far from understanding climate change. But this is not the first time that distinguished scientists have petitioned for more realism in climate science. In Italy, the discoverer of the nuclear antimatter, emeritus professor Antonino Zakichi recently led 48 local science professors in stating that human responsibility for climate change is unjustifiably exaggerated and catastrophic predictions are not realistic. In their scientific view, natural variation explains a substantial part of global warming observed since 1850. The WCD is the latest sign that the settled fantasy surrounding climate change science is rapidly breaking down. Another example is last year, Steve Coonan, who is the former undersecretary of science from the Obama administration, published a book titled Unsettled, in which he noted that, quote, the science is insufficient to make useful projections about how the, how the climate will change over the coming decades, much less what our actions will be. He also noted that rigidly promulgating the idea that climate change is settled demeans and chills the scientific enterprise, retarding its progress in these important matters. And again, this is coming from one of Obama's science guys. He had his awakening in, uh, apparently in 2014 when he and 11 other scientists, six climate scientists and five other physicists uh, were commissioned to stress test the current state of climate science in the United States. One of his big takeaways, among many others, quoting from his book's introduction, quote, I came away from the APS workshop not only surprised, but shaken by the realization that climate science was far less mature than I had supposed. And humans exert a growing but physically small warming influence on the climate. The deficiencies of climate data challenge our ability to untangle the response to human influences from poorly understood natural changes. All right, so I'm glad that 
Kunin had this epiphany and now sees it for what it is. My problem with him and people like him is when he was taking part in recommending insane solutions, which have come to define the far left's obsession with control over the human factor. He helped the genie out of the bottle, and we as citizens are and will pay the price for those bad policy decisions. Also in 2020, a longtime green activist, Michael Schellenberger, wrote a book called Apocalypse Never, in which he said he believed the conversation about climate change and the environment had in the last few years spiraled out of control. Much of what people are told about the environment, including the climate, is wrong, he wrote in his book. To refresh, if you don't know who he is, Michael Schellenberger is an American author, and he's written, uh, his writings have focused on the intersection of climate change, the environment, nuclear power, and politics. He's a co-founder of Breakthrough Institute, co-founder of the California Peace Coalition, and the founder of Envi Environmental Progress. So back to, back to uh, the, this article that I was quoting here. Of course, green extremists in academia, politics, and journalism will continue ar to argue for the command and control they crave through this net zero policy. The climate scientist and writer Willie Soon recently listed a number of academic disciplines that are helpful in studying the changing climate. They include astronomy, solar physics, geology, geochemistry, paleoclimatology, glaciology, oceanography, ecology, and history. The breadth of experience from scientists and non-scientists found in the WCD list encompasses most, if not all, of those areas of study. People with thousands of years of cumulative practical experience are calling for the study of climate science to be less political and for government's climate policies to be more scientific. And so um, one last thing I just wanted to throw out there for you as, as, as food for thought, something to think about. California's governor, Gavin Newsom, recently signed legislation saying they will, you will no longer be able to buy an internal combustion engine vehicle after 2030, with the goal being a push to have everyone uh, eventually have electric vehicles. Forget the expensive price of these vehicles for a minute. California is going through a heat wave right now, and we are rationing electricity. So in this heat wave that we're going through right now, do you know what one of the things they are saying not to do in order to save electricity? You aren't allowed to charge your electric vehicle in this environment. Think about that one for a minute. I said this in the past. I'm all for recycling. I live by the beach, so I want my oceans and beaches to be clean. We no longer have to drive through LA's smog, and we have solar panels on our house. I am all for being a good steward for, of the environment. What I won't stand for is the hypocritical elites trying to force me to lower my standard of living and tell me how to live my life. Get smart and educate yourself so you're not easily manipulated. We are sovereign individuals and are accountable for our actions. And I believe given the opportunity, we'll do the right thing for ourselves, our communities, and for our mother earth. At least that's my hope. Or else we get the current narrative trying to be crammed down our throats and the detrimental policies being promoted. Uh, okay, so that is uh, my take on um, comparing current uh, weather events to past weather events, trying to uh, promote a narrative. Um, I will finish off this episode like I always do. If you're in the military, the police, response, police departments, fire departments, or first responders, if that's you out there, thank you very much for your service. Stay safe. And uh, again, I appreciate everybody watching. This is the Rain Man, and uh, we'll see you next time. Thanks for watching Rain Man's Take, observations on the world we live in. If you like the content, don't forget to hit the subscribe button below. You can also follow Rain Man's Take on Instagram at Rain Man's Take. Also check out our website at www.rainmanstakepodcast.com and send your comments to rainmanstake at gmail.com. Keep an eye out for future podcasts, which will be coming out every Thursday at 5 p.m. West Coast time.